Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you to the United States Institute of Peace. We are very pleased to, to have you here, to welcome the ambassador. It's, uh, it's an honor for us as the Institute of Peace to be able to host uh, the Pakistani ambassador um, uh, as he arrives to take on his new, his new tasks. Um, uh, we have had an opportunity to just have a brief conversation with the ambassador just now. Um, for those of you um, who have not been to this building before, welcome. Uh, Institute of Peace was founded uh, some 32 years ago as a, uh, as, a, as a place devoted to conflict resolution. And uh, we believe that peace is possible, uh, that peace is practical and, practical, and it is necessary for our security and the security of uh, all of our allies and friends. Um, in the region that we're about to talk about here today. Uh, our Asia Center, um, which is kind of sponsoring uh, this session here today, uh, and houses our Pakistan program, our Asia Center under Andrew Wilder, who I'm sure is uh, sitting here somewhere here, and, and, uh, and our Pakistan Center under Mawid uh, Yusuf, um, is, uh, and seeks to advance the Institute's goals in the broader Asia region. Pakistan, along with Afghanistan, remains one of the center's two most important countries of interest, and they are together the two of our largest countries' programs here at USIP. Across the board, one of USIP's strengths is its convening power. Uh, over the past four years, the Pakistan program alone has organized over 110 discussions uh, and public events with Pakistan experts, including uh, prime ministers, ambassadors, and we're very glad, to, Ambassador, to have you as a uh, back here um, uh, for this event. We've had the honor of hosting a number of uh, officials, including Interior Ministry Chaudhry Nisar Ali Khan, Finance Minister Ishak Dar, twice Prime Minister Noir Sharif in 2013 and 2015. Uh, the program derives its real strength from strong network of contacts and partners in Pakistan, uh, where we have maintained a presence since 2013. The Institute partners with civil society organizations, innovators, scholars, and policymakers uh, to support local programs, conduct research and analysis, and convene local peace builders and key stakeholders as we have done here today. Ambassador Chowdhury takes up his post during a very difficult time in relations between Pakistan and its neighbor Afghanistan. Due to persistent tensions on the border, ongoing violence by extremists on both sides, and an enduring refugee crisis. As the U.S. reviews its Afghan strategy, Pakistan will remain a critical player and we hope partner in addressing the deteriorating security situation and improving stability in the region. I and others uh, will be traveling to Pakistan and Afghanistan in the coming weeks, and I look forward to the ambassador's perspective on these issues. We hope this forum will produce a fruitful discussion on ongoing developments in regional relations, as well as potential opportunities for the U.S. and Pakistan to collaborate to help ensure a peaceful future for Afghanistan. Um, Ambassador Aiz Ahmed Chowdhury um, is uh, a professional here. We're very pleased to, to have him here, a member of the Foreign Service of Pakistan with 36 years of bilateral and multilateral experience. He's uh, uh, now the ambassador to uh, the United States, as you know, since the 13th of March. Earlier, he served as the Foreign Secretary of Pakistan from 27 December 2013 to 12 March 2017. Prior to this, he served as the Foreign Office spokesman. Uh, always a challenging, uh, always a challenging position. Um, so um, uh, we are very pleased today to host the uh, ambassador in his, in his new capacity, and I'm very pleased to turn over the, uh, the, the forum to the ambassador. He will be followed, uh, his remarks will be followed by a moderated discussion by uh, Mawid Yusuf, Yusuf, who I've uh, just described, and ambassador, welcome to the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taylor, and uh, thank you also to the United States Institute of Peace, uh, which has become a, a fairly known name uh, with us. 
and uh, it is not a surprise that many of our leaders have come and spoken here. Uh, that speaks of the prestige you enjoy as an institute in our eyes, uh, and uh, the statistics that you gave, which were very impressive, clearly show that Institute of Peace uh, uh, can serve and has served well as a, as a venue for dialogue to help resolve and address conflicts all over the world. So thank you so much for your hospitality this morning uh, to me and to provide me opportunity to share our perspective on a topic which is extremely important for my country and I believe also for your country. But let me preface my talk, uh, which focuses on Afghanistan, with a few observations that I have uh, about, uh, uh, about the perceptions here uh, which are prevailing uh, since my arrival, which is about two weeks. What I've noticed is that the perceptions uh, prevailing here are lagging behind the reality of today's Pakistan. And the reality of today's Pakistan is moving at a much faster pace uh, for the better, uh, both on security domains and also in the economic fields. On security domain, we have come a long way uh, in first building a nationwide consensus against terrorism in any form, in all its forms and manifestations and clearing up vast territories in bordering uh, Afghanistan, which became home to many of those terrorists. And today, the entire, what we used to call as federally administered, administered tribal areas have been cleared up. And the proof of, uh, of that is that that 90% of the people who were displaced by the Taliban and the others have gone back to their homes and, and stitching together their normal lives. Uh, we are now engaged in combing out the remaining terrorists who may have been hiding in various civilian uh, urban centers. And that work has, is also under, under progress. And all this has had a salutary effect on the economy of Pakistan. And we can see our growth rates going up, which is 4.7% this year. We are told that it would be 5% next year. In fact, IMF has upgraded our uh, forecast. Uh, and there is a optimism in the air. And we are very pleased with this. And I, my sense is that and that there is a need for us to work harder to bring you all, the Pakistan watchers, up to speed on what's happening in Pakistan and how fast this change is, is occurring. Uh, a few words also about our relations with the United States, which again is a very important area for my country. Our relations with the United States is uh, of utmost importance. Uh, personally, I have lived in this country before. I've served in this mission, although only for one year before I got pulled out to New York where my former boss wanted me uh, to work with him. And there I worked over six years. And earlier I had done my master's in Tufts University. So it's a familiar country, great people, a resilient nation, great values. Uh, so I am very, very pleased to be back uh, to the United States and uh, to a country uh, with which our uh, leadership and our people uh, attach immense importance. Now let me revert to the um, topic of the day, which is on uh, um, Afghanistan. Uh, now this uh, subject is uh, extremely important uh, for, for my country. Uh, it is important because there is a full consensus in Pakistan that peace in Afghanistan is an absolute imperative for Pakistan. Time has shown and history has shown that whenever Afghanistan was unstable, we suffered. 
the instability invariably flows across that border into Pakistan. And therefore, we have a full consensus that we need peace in Afghanistan. And we would like to work with any and every effort that is aimed at bringing peace and stability in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, the situation in Afghanistan is not very encouraging. The security situation is, uh, uh, is not good. Uh, according to President Ashraf Ghani in an interview that he gave to a newspaper when he was visiting India, 60% territory is under the control of Afghan National Security Forces, 10% with the Taliban and 30% contested. That is the words from the President of Afghanistan. Maybe percentages might might have changed, maybe a little different. But we are talking of huge ungoverned spaces still. And they can be magnet for militants of the world. And that is something which is a source of worry. The other source of worry for us is that uh, the, the, the Taliban and the, and the you know, Haqqanis and many others who fled from Pakistan after the operations uh, have teamed up with many other groups and have branded themselves into different groups. And one such group which has come up uh, is uh, uh, called Daesh uh, or ISIL K, some people call it, referring to the Khorasan province in the northeast uh, uh, of Afghanistan. So that is also a, a source of huge concern for us, particularly because the Daesh concentration is in the provinces bordering Pakistan, particularly Nangarhar, and therefore it is extremely important, worrying for us, because while we have established peace in our side of the Afghan border at huge cost, to us, uh, we don't see a corresponding uh, stability on the on the other side. Uh, the the peace on our side didn't come easily. It was at a huge cost. Uh, when we were engaged in discussions between Pakistan, Afghanistan, and United States and China, uh, there was a constant uh, desire and demand from the Afghan side and also from the U.S. side that we should take action against the Taliban and the Haqqanis who may be hiding in the Pakistani territory. And we, we finally said, fine, we had this worry that there would be a, a backlash and many of the Pakistani version of the Taliban, like which we call them as TTP, who had gone across the border and made sanctuaries inside Afghanistan, would team up with these TTA and because they share the ideology and we will have another war at our hand. And so this was a, a concern at the back of our, uh, our mind, having paid a huge price, you know, 7,000 soldiers and officers were lost in clearing up the tribal areas. Now it says, it's, for any military commander, it's, it's a huge, huge burden to carry. Uh, when, he won't, when he meets the families of those soldiers, he realizes that uh, what it takes. Uh, but our people, because of the consensus that we had achieved against uh, terrorism, we were able to uh, carry everybody along and we, we were able to establish that uh, uh, that peace. Nevertheless, in deference to the wishes of the Afghan government and the and the and the United States, we started squeezing space for the Taliban and the Haqqanis. We had cautioned also that once we do that, the leverage for us on the Taliban would 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 go that much uh, low or diminish because we will not be able to uh, uh, nudge them towards reconciliation. Nevertheless, we still went ahead and started squeezing space, and today, they, most of them have uh, no space in Pakistan. They have fled. Uh, some of them went up the high mountains, and we were able to deal with them there. Some of them went into the Afghan territory, Afghanistan, uh, and some of them went into our urban centers. Well, in the our urban centers, we have started that operation, as I indicated to you. But those who went to Afghanistan, they gave a fillip to the insurgency, and you can see that uh, the, the instability actually has grown after that. Now, this is a situation which is not a very, uh, a very happy uh, occasion. Uh, 
uh, and we also, uh, uh, you know, on the military track, we we could not make much success on the political track. We could not make much success. So the situation is what it is before you. So, but let's explore both these options one by one to see where do we go forward. The military option. We believe in Pakistan that there is no military solution. If there was one, then it would have come by when the NATO forces were in their peak. After 15, 16 years of huge military and economic investments, uh, mainly by the United States, but also by other NATO partners of the United States, uh, <clears throat> there is not much to show for. And that's a ma matter of, I'm sure, of concern to your country, to my country, to, to your taxpayers and to others. And uh, we believe that uh, we should not uh, rely solely on the military option. Uh, the, uh, the political track uh, also uh, had to be uh, nudged forward. Unfortunately, on the political track, uh, the progress was uh, not satisfactory. Uh, we made some good progress. We worked hard, uh, both uh, Pakistan and United States, uh, 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 and Afghanistan um, had agreed that we should move forward the reconciliation track. Uh, reconciliation would mean that the Taliban sh of Afghanistan should sit together with the legitimate, democratically elected government of Afghanistan and come at a, some kind of political uh, solution, uh, some kind of negotiated peace. Uh, and so we started making strenuous efforts during 2015, and uh, on 7th of July 2015, I remember uh, that the Taliban uh, came face to face uh, with the Afghan uh, government. Uh, that was a long night. Uh, it was Ramadan, and it started after what they call as breakfast, the, the evening dinner, and then it went right up to the uh, to the Seher or the or the morning. Uh, this was the first face-to-face -face contact between the Taliban uh, and the Haqqanis and the Afghan government. Hitherto, for the Taliban never recognized the Afghan government. And so by sitting on that table that night, they <coughs> sort of acknowledged uh, it was a step forward from them, uh, that government which was uh, across the table uh, from them as the legitimate or the elected government of Afghanistan. So we thought that that was a step forward. And that night we were able to discuss uh, while Pakistan, uh, United States and China watched uh, as observers, uh, the Afghan government and the Taliban uh, spoke their heart out to each other. Uh, it was a difficult dialogue, but it was a good beginning. And we were hoping to do another round on 31st July, when on 29th July, just two days before, uh, mm, the news broke out that the that Mullah Umar had died, and this sort of uh, uh, set a stir in the in the Taliban ranks, and uh, uh, and the process got shelved. Then we uh, picked up the pieces and in December 2015 we formed what is called QCG, Coordinated Coordination Group, when we all four came together and agreed that let's make, let's make a, a concerted effort once again for picking up the re reconciliation track. And we worked for another five months, uh, five months and five meetings and we were able to put together a roadmap, agreed on the parameters within which this reconciliation will take place and within which the use of force will also happen. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, on 21 May, uh, Mullah Akhtar Mansoor, with whom the negotiations were going on, uh, was, uh, was killed by a drone strike uh, by the United States. Now, that uh, uh, again was a setback to the, uh, to the uh, reconciliation process because the, the Taliban leadership became more evasive and, and uh, would not uh, come forward. Uh, and also, it, sta it started with, with the with the splintering of the Taliban, many of their commanders, because the new commander was not able to wield that much control, and some of them started fleeing. And 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 just about that time, the Daesh started to take roots in uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, we uh, we.
we believe that uh, while there is no military solution, uh, we have to have a, a, a track uh, which is political in nature uh, and uh, something which can uh, bring all the relevant players uh, together uh, to find a solution that brings peace in Afghanistan. Uh, as uh, I indicated to you right in the, in the beginning of my talk, for us, peace is extremely important because if Afghanistan is not peaceful, we continue to, uh, continue to, to suffer. Uh, then we have uh, the, uh, okay, where do we go from here? I, because that's important too. Uh, we are waiting for the United States new administration to announce uh, its, uh, the outcome of its review. We understand the review is being carried out and, and a policy will be pronounced, so we'll wait for that. Uh, and uh, based on that, we would like to, uh, to engage with the United States, uh, which we still believe is the, is the main player, uh, which has invested huge stakes in Afghanistan's peace. And we need to work together to uh, to achieve peace and stability in Afghanistan. Uh, we, uh, I would, uh, you know, indicate five tracks uh, to uh, in which, in our, in our view, uh, should be pursued if, uh, to to go forward. First, of course, that we should not solely rely on the military solution. Uh, military, military force is important, but the wars are not an answer. Wars create more problems than they can solve. And in this day and age, we should have more faith in, 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 the, in the skills uh, and negotiations that can, can, can resolve issues. In fact, your institutes and many such forums exactly prove the point that there are alternatives to, to war and, and, and military solutions. The second uh, point that I would like to make is uh, that the relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan are of crucial importance. Both governments need to keep talking to each other, not, not engage in any, any hostility. Uh, unfortunately, the present government in Afghanistan chose to commit considerable hostile rhetoric against Pakistan, but it was the policy of the, of the, of the present government in Pakistan not to respond, and there is not one hostile statement on record at any level of governance from from my country. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, rhetoric is not a hostile rhetoric is not not the answer. Uh, the logic sometimes given is that Pakistan is responsible for all the ills in Afghanistan. Now this is an oversimplification of facts in our in in our view. Afghanistan has myriad of problems from governance to corruption to economic stress, to whatever. Uh, and because we treat Afghanistan as a sovereign, independent country, we do not make any comment on the, on, on the Afghan uh, internal situation. Uh, but to say that everything uh, that is bad in, Pakistan, in Afghanistan is because of Pakistan, in our view, is, a, is, is, is not a correct uh, picture and not a correct attitude either. Uh, we believe that the two governments need to talk. They need to talk at all levels, uh, leadership to leadership, political to political, uh, diplomatic uh, to diplomatic, mill to mill, and intel to intel. I think all, all approaches are required simultaneously to work together to bring uh, um, our two governments uh, uh, in a mode where they can they can coordinate uh, with each other uh, for the for the common uh, good and uh, the london meeting which happened recently uh, was a step i think in the right direction because it talked about a mechanism of this kind where the two can can begin to uh, uh, to work together the third uh, track, uh, in our view, is the border management. We believe that uh, this border, which had remained ungoverned for centuries, and uh, there were people who were crossing uh, in large numbers across the border uh, without any passport or any, any documentation whatsoever uh, for easement rights or for whatever reasons, uh, I think that has not helped the matter. Uh, we think that an effectively managed border would, would be 
good for Pakistan and would be good for Afghanistan. Uh, why I say that is because uh, there is a complaint from Pakistan side that people, bad guys, come from Afghanistan side and create uh, mischief on Pakistan side and terrorism on Pakistan side and go back. And the Afghan side has a complaint that people from Pakistan side come to Afghanistan, create or, or, or make mischief in Afghanistan and go back. So in order to interdict such cross-border movement of terrorists, it is extremely important that we have a managed border uh, uh, between the two countries. And we have started unilaterally working on that. And we do hope that uh, Afghanistan government would come on board uh, on that effort, because uh, uh, that, is, that is important for them um, as much as it is important uh, for my country. Uh, this border management does not mean stopping or sealing the border. It should not be mistaken uh, for that, because what we are trying to do is to regulate the movement to those who are legitimate and bona fide travelers, uh, but not uh, open for those uh, terrorists or people with, uh, with, uh, sh with links to, to terrorism. The fourth track I would indicate is the need for the refugees, Afghan refugees, to go back to their homes. Uh, for 15 years, billions of economic investment was made in Afghanistan, but never to the uh, to to create conducive conditions for Afghanistan's own people to go back. Uh, over three million have lived in Pakistan for 37 years. Uh, you know, in in many countries and continents, even one million refugees is a big issue. And we have hosted for 37 years over 3 million refugees. And even now, the Prime Minister of Pakistan believes that they should go back in honor and dignity, and we will not push them. But we believe that some kind of conducive conditions should be created in Afghanistan uh, for, uh, for their return. I think it's a legitimate expectation. Given what's happening in the world, I think everybody would understand that it's, it's not an unfair expectation. And the fifth one is. Uh, uh, is also a most important one, that how do we move the reconciliation forward? How do we move the negotiated peace uh, uh, forward? Uh, we, there are different groups in play, different combinations. We have trilaterals, quadrilaterals, six plus one, uh, many. Uh, new ones are also emerging. Uh, new players, regional players are also becoming active. Uh, uh, we believe that uh, uh, whatever works, uh, we are ready to work with that. Uh, we think that uh, QCG was a good forum. Uh, it was not given a fair chance to, to work. Uh, but of course, uh, QCG is not Pakistan's uh, baby alone. Uh, we believe that there were uh, three other players. And if the three other players want, uh, a venue is needed uh, for these people to come together and make a strenuous effort, a genuine effort, to, uh, to facilitate the peace. At, at the end of the day, it, is, it has to be Afghan government and the Afghan polity and Afghan uh, uh, groups which have to come together. Pakistan and Afghan and United States and China can only play a facilitative role. And that's that's the role we envisage for ourselves. It was an expectation from us that we will push Taliban and the Haqqanis. We are doing that. We, are, we have done way uh, we, uh, ahead in, in, in that uh, course. Uh, but we believe that uh, at the same time, efforts have to be created to be made to create that conditions which will facilitate a, a negotiated peace in Afghanistan uh, so that the United States, which has also invested so much for so long uh, in that country, uh, is also able to, uh, to leave with a, with a peace of mind that it has stabilized Afghanistan before uh, it left. So that's where I would uh, uh, pause and, uh, uh, and then we'll learn more from each other on the question and answers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Chaudhary, for that very comprehensive um, rundown on Pakistan's position on Afghanistan. I've actually not heard of the, the five-point plan before, and I think it will be very useful for, 
for the audience here. So what we'll do now is I'll ask a few questions. We'll have a, a brief conversation. And then I promise to open it up and leave more than enough time for all of you to have a chance to ask uh, the ambassador uh, questions. I know he's a fan of tough questions, so don't hold back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's what being spokesman teaches you. <laughs> Perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. So, Ambassador, let me begin by asking, I think, as I said, you were very comprehensive in this, but one thing as, as somebody who watches this region uh, and studies it, and, and a number of others in the audience who do the same, I'm somebody who straddles the line on both sides, and you know, the conversations in Pakistan and the US, one thing I've always been troubled by is the different realities I hear from both sides. Um, the conversations on the same topics, if I'm in Islamabad and talking to responsible people, um, what is presented seems to be very different than the view in this town and vice versa. So I think the first question I'll ask you is the mistrust in this relationship. Is that a function of miscommunication? Is that, you think, a function of bad policies? Or is it really that both sides are not understanding the other's sort of point of view of reality on the ground? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it is not unusual for people to have uh, different perspectives of the same situation. I look at this glass from this angle, and the and Mr. Wilders looks at it from the, his angle. So it's quite quite natural, in my view. Plurality of views is, is always good. And that's why you called me here to listen to this perspective. So that, that's quite natural. But I do not think that relations have any mistrust. I do not think so. I think maybe uh, some people may have plugged this line, but we have absolute uh, open communications with the United States uh, through your embassy there, and as well as through a stream of visitors from all walks of United States life. Uh, they come, they, they engage in, uh, in candid conversations with us. Uh, we have nothing to hide. In fact, we want to show them what, and I'm keen, and you would remember upstairs, I, I made that offer that we would like people to go and, and see for themselves. Seeing is believing. And only uh, six months back, uh, two of your esteemed senators were there. And one of them actually came and wrote an op-ed on what he saw. So I think it is extremely important, and that was the starting point that I was making, that you know, we need to bridge that gap between the perception and the ground reality. And I'm here, here to do that, but I would want your, you to be my partners and come and see for yourself what has actually happened and how how closely we want to engage with the United States government, how closely we want to work together, because we, we saw that by working together, we achieved results. We achieved results. I don't want to enumerate those, but the, but the long struggle that we had uh, against terrorism ever since 9-11, I think, is a testament of, uh, of that common work. So let me ask you, if, if I may follow up on this, are you then suggesting that there is a there's a bit of a disconnect between the conversations that happen behind closed doors between officials and what the public narratives on both sides may be? Because uh, I think there's little sort of disagreement on the fact that the narratives in both capitals about the other uh, are not too pleasant. Um, and so is that then a disconnect? And how do you bridge that? Uh, well, in my country, the narrative about the about United States is, is pretty good. Is positive. Uh, yes, there will be some people who would like to say what they want to say. And I believe the same uh, holds true for United States. What I hear uh, from many of the interlocutors when they talk to me one-on-one, uh, uh, -on -one, I see very positive feedback. Uh, and I also go around and, 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 and I don't see. Yes, there will be criticism. Yes, there will be certain areas on which we don't agree, uh, on which the U.S. would probably want to lay more emphasis than Pakistan can or, or, or does. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, uh, the, any kind of uh, you know, disconnect uh, of sort. Uh, it is possible that some of the lobbies could be at work to, uh, to 
to give the impression of a disconnect between the uh, what you said at uh, at uh, the government to government or G to G level and uh, in the narrative which is in the in the out in the public. Uh, but I believe that uh, even there, uh, uh, the writings of a few uh, critical people do not really uh, give the uh, in, you know correct picture of the uh, of the totality of the United States. Uh, the relations between Pakistan and the United States. Uh, are multifaceted, have always been, uh, and uh, and follow different strands. And I see a lot of cooperation going on in so many of these uh, these uh, tracks. Uh, so I am actually more optimistic than your question suggests. I am a pessimist by nature, so I'll accept <laughs> that before we begin. Um, but I'll, I'll come. Uh, we'll just have a conversation first. Uh, but I think what worries people, perhaps, in this town. Uh, and and you, you're absolutely right in terms of the G to G. You know, you pick up any sort of polling or survey uh, of the Pakistani people, and the favorability rating of the U.S. shows up at as low as 9 percent at one time, but on a good day about 15, 18, 20 percent. For a partner that's been there for 70 years, as, as you suggest, that's an anomaly. I mean, I wouldn't say that's an optimistic number. Uh, and so I think a lot of people wonder, um, after all this partnership, and some would argue a lot of assistance and, and sort of, you know, work with Pakistan, why then this unfavorable kind of opinion of the country? I think uh, mm, this is a skewed. I, I'm not sure how accurate the polls are. Okay. You have seen it yourself very recently. So I think polls do not <laughs> necessarily give the, the most accurate picture of the society. Uh, my, my sense is uh, that uh, there's a lot uh, that is perhaps not known to the people. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of work that had gone into uh, our fight together uh, against the uh, against uh, the forces of terrorism. Uh, it was not easy to to decimate Al Qaeda. Today we can say it that easily, but. In the early 2000s, it was not an easy task, and and 650 operatives to catch them and eliminate them, or you know, uh, so it was not an easy task. I think we did, and then you know, Pakistan never knew what is suicide bombing. We did, we did not know that until all these people who came to fight Afghan Jihad and then they came over to Pakistan, towards Pakistan after 9-11, we actually ended up with, it, with, with that bag in our hand. But we did not shy away from that. We decided to fight that also. Of course, in conjunction with your country, but more so as a, as a commitment to ourselves, our leadership, Four years, three, four years ago, made a commitment to our own people that we would not allow any terrorists to remain in Pakistan, and we would not allow any terrorists to use Pakistan soil to commit terrorism anywhere in the world. So I think that commitment we are following through. And I think it is well in line with what the United States has also been wanting and saying, and not only the United States, but also Afghanistan, India, and other countries in the region. I think everybody would benefit from the approach that Pakistan uh, has followed and is continuing to follow. And I think uh, we have shown results. We have shown results on the ground, and you'll see probably much more in the coming, uh, in coming months. If I may, let me switch a little bit to the regional puzzle, if you will, on Afghanistan. And one of the conventional wisdoms, of course, is that unless the region works together, Afghanistan's near and far neighbors, uh, peace in Afghanistan uh, will not ensue. Uh, Pakistan, of course, is, is probably the most important one, uh, without a doubt. But there are also other regional dynamics. You just mentioned, you know, the six plus one, there's the quadrilateral. But one of the um, actors that has become much more active in um, this process is Russia. Uh, the Chinese were already part of the QCG, but then, um, and I believe Pakistan has also been part of uh, the meetings that Moscow has hosted on Afghanistan, uh, one of them actually without Afghanistan um, as well recently. What is Pakistan's vision of this regional peace? Because one of the questions I would have is, isn't this 
increasingly looking like a minus U.S. formula. I understand the U.S. was invited this time, did not go, but for a country that's made so much investment, isn't there a fair question to ask whether this is now a parallel system? Well, Russia invited us uh, for the trilateral meeting between Pakistan, uh, China, and, uh, and uh, Russia. Uh, this was last December, and uh, we did go because we were invited. Uh, and uh, our question uh, to the host at that time was uh, that we are talking about Afghanistan. Where is Afghanistan? Yeah. So in the joint statement, it was agreed to to invite Afghanistan uh, to the next meeting, whatever, when it happened. And that is exactly how it So in the second meeting, Afghanistan was there. And I did not go into the second meeting. I went for the first meeting. Uh, but in the second meeting, uh, there was a discussion to invite uh, uh, Central Asia and United States in the third meeting. And I believe the third meeting is being scheduled for April, for the month of April. And I understand Central Asia would be there. And uh, we heard that United States uh, has been invited, but not, is not intending to, to participate. Uh, I think uh, there, as I indicated to you, there is a multiplicity of tracks, because people are frustrated why Afghanistan is not stabilizing. The whole region is suffering from that. Of course, the biggest sufferers are the people of Afghanistan. They have suffered for for three generations. I mean, it's not fair to them. Sure. They have suffered the most, and they have suffered the agony and the pain. Uh, and therefore, uh, our, all our sympathies should be should uh, should be to that fact. So that's why people are desperately trying to find out some kind of formula that would that would work. If nothing was so, every country has is, is trying to uh, to uh, uh, come up with its own recipes. Uh, I. Sh told you what my preference sure. uh, is, uh, but uh, of course I don't uh, want to make any comment on the efforts that are being made by many other countries actually, mm -hmm. including Russia. Okay. Um, on, on, I promise I will come to you, not to worry, I will. Just give me a couple more minutes. Um, on Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, you talked about um, the relationship being very important and rightly pointed out that both countries should continue to work together. Um, you did explain sort of the refugee situation and also the border. But if I may ask that from another, if you look at the glass from the other side, mm -hmm. it may actually, you're right that there haven't been hostile statements, but perhaps these two actions in terms of the refugees and the way the policy uh, is being implemented and the border may look like hostile actions if you're sitting in Afghanistan or perhaps somewhere else. So. If the argument is rightly that both sides have to work together no matter what, then could you explain how Pakistan's recent actions on the refugees and on the border help the situation? Because at the end of the day, it's only pushed the Kabul government to perhaps be even more hostile. Well, for border management, uh, we do um, expect uh, that uh, there would be a corresponding action on the other side, uh, not only by Afghan national security forces, there are limits of uh, uh, capacity and other uh, areas, but also uh, we expect the U.S. also to, to contribute towards that. Uh, but, uh, that, that, but we have never held it against them. What we are doing is that we are building those posts on all the areas which were frequently crossed over. And uh, we are investing uh, all this effort on our side of the, the border and with our own money. And when General Nicholson was there, our army chief uh, took him uh, and made him fly over the, uh, over the border and showed him that, look, the protection of this border is a common responsibility. But look, there are all posts on our side. What about the other side and who will build them and why Why should those be built? Because if you have complained that people go from here and and and, and create uh, terrorism, then, then I think it's all the more reason that you have an interest in that. As far as refugees is concerned, I think uh, we, uh, the kind of hospitality we have shown, no country in the world has shown. Uh, the, look at the numbers, uh, and uh, and even now the policy is not to push them, not to push them, and we will not push them, but we do want UNSCR and 
even United States and others to help Afghan government to create those conditions. After all, these people might need to go back. And I remember that in the beginning of the Ashraf Ghani government, there were indications that perhaps many of these people will get land rights once they go back. And whatever incentives is for the Afghan government to, to work out. But whatever incentives can be, can be created for the pull factor, then we don't have to depend on the push factor because we don't want to depend on the push factor. So pull factors is extremely important. But to, but the status quo and saying that, no, Pakistan has hosted them for 37 years, 3 million, keep doing like that. Status quo is the best answer. I'm sorry, it's not. We need to find a way forward on that. Uh, I think that's why I would just point out that as we speak, there is actually a real humanitarian crisis on the other side of the border um, in Afghanistan uh, because of the refugees going back. So even if the policy is uh, maybe there is better coordination that, that could take place to avoid a, a humanitarian catastrophe. Let me ask two more questions and then I'll open up and I've, I've I helped. think you might want to open up the question. I, I am. But come in the end. I, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to ask you the toughest ones now and I'm, I don't want to leave these. Leave All right. These. Okay. Um, the first one is um, I didn't hear the word India uh, for the most part in, in, your, in your talk. Um, but, uh, of course, India remains, you know, one of the key elements of the regional peace and Pakistan's relationship with India, we all know, uh, are very troubled, especially now. Uh, what I wanted to push you on is the, the argument that Pakistan has gone after all militant groups uh, and is not going to let the soil be used. Um, I think it's, you know, on, on the anti-India, traditionally anti-India groups, that is not an accurate statement. Um, I mean, visibly, one can see the presence of groups that ultimately hurt Pakistan more than anybody else, but the jamaat davas of the world, the LETs of the world, uh, their leaders are there and free and known and seen. Um, how, how does one reconcile the idea that Pakistan is sincerely going after all groups or, you know, has a plan to do that, while it's, it's clear that one part of it, at least at, to this point, is not, has not been affected? Thank you. Yeah, I didn't uh, bring uh, India into the talk because that was not. No, I'm grateful for that. The topic. I'm grateful for that. Uh, not to say that India is also using Afghan soil for certain ends, uh, but we, I, I deliberately left that out. Uh, our approach to India, uh, towards India, is very clear, especially this government. Uh, we want. Uh, a peaceful, cooperative, good neighborly relations with India. And our offer stands. When Prime Minister Modi uh, was inaugurated, our Prime Minister was very much there, and later on Prime Minister Modi came to his home in Lahore. I think we, uh, th this uh, desire on the part of Pakistan to have good relations with India uh, uh, is very much manifest in every way, uh, so much so that it is also included in the, in the charter or the manifesto of the ruling party. Uh, we, uh, it is unfortunate that every time both countries have tried to work together and come together for a dialogue, some terrorist incident has happened. And uh, we believe that uh, the terrorists are nobody's friend, neither that of India nor Pakistan. So uh, uh, whenever India suspends the dialogue, the terrorists, terrorists sit back and wait for next time when these two countries will come together, and then they'll come, they come to life again. Now, we, I believe that if the... Uh, if, the if the Indians and the Pakistanis keep talking, then the objectives of the terrorists would be frustrated much more, much better. Because if you suspend the dialogue, you do exactly what these terrorists want you to do, to sure. not to have dialogue. So that is why we have repeatedly stressed the importance of dialogue, but we don't say that, of course, dialogue cannot happen unless both sides are ready. And since India is not ready and has made it clear that it is not, uh, we will wait for a time when India is ready to, to, uh, to, to have dialogue with us. Uh, we will, they will find us ready. We believe that uh, the answer to any intractable problem, howsoever intractable it may be, is still lies on sitting across the table and, and talking. So that approach we will maintain. As for the terrorist group, I have already, I think, indicated to you, and I think seeing is believing because you would discover it for yourself. 
the leadership of Pakistan made a commitment to the people of Pakistan that we will not allow any terrorists to remain on our soil, any. And we will not allow anyone to use our soil to plan terrorism anywhere. Sure. Anywhere sure. in the world. I think that is a commitment that is unto ourselves. It's not a favor to any country. It's a commitment that we have given to ourselves and we are well on our course in, in, in doing that. And anyone found to be committing terrorism or using our soil to plan terrorism will be taken to task. And we are well on our course uh, on, on that strategy. And hopefully, uh, you know, you are here and I'm here and these people are here and we'll see where it goes. Okay. So let me open up. I'm about to get booze now, I know. Um, so let me start from here. We'll go around the room and if there's time, we'll, we'll come back for a conversation. Uh, the lady in the front. And there'll be mics that'll come to you. Please wait because this is also being webcast live. Yes. Um, Marie Salino, thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks. An important aspect of what you have discussed uh, is the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, since the 20th of January, when the new administration came in, how you would describe the relationship, how, he, how it has launched, and how you see it going forward? Well, uh, it has been our long-standing policy to uh, deal with every elected government of the United States in good faith and in all earnest. And that's what we will do. Uh, uh, we are already in touch with the new administration. Uh, our initial contacts are very encouraging and positive. And we would hope that uh, that once we uh, once the whole government is in place, uh, I, I understand some positions are yet to be filled in, in Department of State and, and, and other departments. Uh, once that is done, that is done, we would definitely like to engage in a very serious dialogue because we think there's a lot of business uh, to be to be uh, conducted between Pakistan and United States. Gentleman here. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador. I wish to uh, congratulate you on your new position. Thank you, sir. My name is Abdul Ali Siraj. I'm a nephew of His Majesty King Amanullah Khan of Afghanistan, wow. and also the president of the National Coalition for Dialogue with the Tribes of Afghanistan. Wow. Your Excellency, <clears throat> although I may have difference of opinion of what you stated this uh, morning, the one point that I totally agree with you, sir, that the situation between Afghanistan and Pakistan is not going to be solved militarily. And I also strongly believe that uh, uh, the governments, uh, the common governments go, uh, and they have not been able to reach uh, a solution between our two nations and such. We both have lost a number of our citizens at the hands of the terrorists because of the disagreements. Uh, we have a lot of at odd, you know, but I've, I've, I've come to the conclusion, sir, that you can catch more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. So my recommendation, I think, is to get rid of the vinegar and bring the honey. Yeah. But the honey part of it, sir, has to, does not have to include the government, does not have to include the military. Yeah. I think it is time that the peoples yeah. of Afghanistan and Pakistan, representatives of the people, I am not a member of the Afghan government, I don't speak for the Afghan government, but I'm the voice of the people of Afghanistan. I'm the voice of the tribes of Afghanistan. As you may know um, what family I belong to <clears throat> and how much responsibility I have. Yeah. Do you think, sir, it is possible the largest uh, group in Pakistan are the Punjabis, and on the Afghan side are the Pashtuns. But we also have other uh, tribes in Afghanistan, and also you have others on your side. Can we not get the representatives? Forget about the Taliban, sir. There is no such a thing as who, which Taliban are we talking about? Yeah. But I'm looking for a solution between our people. Yeah. You have been good enough to host our, our, our population for a lot of years. I totally I thank you for that. Mm. But I think it is time that our people got together and sat around the table. I had discussed this with Governor Arugzai in Peshawar some time ago. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is possible to make sure that our people get together instead of governments and let them come with a solution and let them tell our governments on what they wish? Nobody's asking the people. So this is my question to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, congratulations on such proud lineage that you have. Uh, mm, uh, I cannot agree more 
with the point that you made. I think at the end of the day, it is the people of the two countries who are the ultimate custodian of relations between them. It is the people of the two countries who have to live with each other, who have lived with each other for centuries and will continue to live with, with each other. The governments come and go but the people have to live on. And I cannot agree more with you. Of course, government-to-government uh, -government relations are also important, but it should be the job of the government to to spur, to increase, to augment the people-to-people -people contacts. Uh, I know that some people-to-people -people contacts uh, are happening, some efforts are being made, uh, and uh, my sense is that we need to do much more on that. I am fully on board with your suggestion, sir. Gentleman here, and I'll keep, keep rolling. Mr. Ambassador, Pakistan is the Could you only please introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. My name is Ehsan Ahmed. I work with Rabba Times. My question is in regards to the Pakistan state-sponsored persecution of Ahmadi Muslims, and Pakistan is the only country that prohibits the Islamic call to prayer, the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum, and prohibits Ahmadis from reading the Quran. And it's considered a criminal act, so people can be persecuted under the anti-terror laws for just doing that. So how do you justify the use of anti-terror laws against the religious minority Ahmadiyya Muslims? Thank you for your question, but I do not agree with you that there is any state sponsorship of such activity. Far from that. Uh, all citizens of Pakistan are equal in their rights under the Constitution, and if any misguided people take law into their hands against any community, including Ahmadiyya community, they must not do so. And the government tries and will continue to take every step in that direction. All Pakistanis are worthy of equal respect. And, and that is the position that we have taken, and we will continue to pursue that line uh, till we achieve our, our results in, in full and to your satisfaction and to the satisfaction of uh, other such minority groups. Could I, if I may follow up, and I'll come to you, sir, on minority rights, because this is one of the questions that's, that's been raised frequently, um, and in the past, of course, there have been problems um, that we know of. Is there a different approach by the current government? Is there a different vision going forward in the long run to ensure that some of these things, uh, even if these miscreants are acting on their own lone wolves or however we define them, um, how does one look at Pakistan 10, 15, 20 years from now as far as minority rights are concerned? We look at Pakistan to be a pluralistic, democratic, tolerant Pakistan. And uh, the present government is, uh, is very sensitive to this question. Uh, that is why the Prime Minister makes it a point, and so do the other you know, leaders in the cabinet rank, to attend the Hindu events, because he was there in Hindu Holi, to share their happiness, to give a, a rounded message to everybody that all citizens of Pakistan, regardless of their faith, or caste, or creed, or color, are equal citizens of Pakistan, and worthy of equal respect and equal rights. I think that's the direction we are taking. And uh, similarly for the Christians, a lot of effort is going on uh, to, uh, to make sure that they are safe, but not only is they are safe, but they thrive and, uh, and prosper in Pakistan as proud Pakistanis. So that's the direction. Second, we have taken a number of uh, institutional steps okay. uh, 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 to reduce the space for the miscreants. Uh, we have signed on to a large number of human rights uh, instruments. Uh, for example, in the last five years, we have signed on to ICCPR, okay. ICESCR, uh, CAT, which is against torture, and, and several others. And we have presented ourselves before the Universal Periodic Review, UPR, in United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva in 2008, and then again in 2012, and this time again. We had 80 recommendations. We have implemented most of them. We got the 66 recommendations. Second time, we implemented most of them because we believe that it is in our own interest to do so, 
These are very important uh, members of the Pakistani polity and society. And I think that is exactly what we want to do, and we will, we will continue this march until the, the objective which I stated uh, is achieved. Gentlemen there. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, your presentation today. It's been very good. Doug Brooks with the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my question is, there's a number of groups on both sides of the border, uh, commercial groups, that would love to open up the relations uh, between the countries. Uh, as you know, the, the uh, Afghans are using the uh, Pakistan port less than they probably should uh, because of all the restrictions on trade on the, at the border and so on. Is there anything the Pakistan government is doing or could do to um, improve this? And this would certainly be, a, uh, I think, a major major way to improve the relations between the countries. Absolutely. I think uh, uh, under uh, international law, Pakistan is bound to give access to landlocked Afghanistan and landlocked Tajikistan, and whichever has to, to the ports of Pakistan. And we are honoring that commitment, not today, but for seven decades. And we will continue to do that. Uh, bulk of Afghan uh, commodities have always come from that. And you know, sometimes in the past, we have suffered hugely for that, because they, the imports for Afghanistan come without any customs duties, and the similar imports, let's say if a refrigerator comes in, <coughs> it gets a certain amount of customs duty on that. So the, while the Afghan refrigerator is traveling across the length of the country, before it crosses the border, there are people who would unload it right there because they can make more money right there. So that had encouraged uh, smuggling and brought a lot of economic injury to Pakistan. But that has not uh, deterred us from honoring that commitment. We will still continue to do that. Yes, we, we can make it better. We should make it better. This is a commitment we have never reneged on. We we will still like to do it. And I remember that when President Ashraf Ghani came to Pakistan in November 2014, and after that, uh, the finance minister was there, we had a 44-point uh, formula. We are still committed to that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Afghanistan government uh, is, needs some more time to, uh, to to start that dialogue, but we are ready to, to talk about it. Uh, you being uh, a member of the chamber, of course, you would uh, understand the importance of it. Most of the, most of the transit countries have much more stringent regimes for access to the landlocked countries to prevent injury to their own, own, own region. We have a far more liberal, and I can say empirically that we have a far more liberal uh, liberal regime. But what we can do is a lot, lot more can be done on the customs point, for example, customs tariff duties can be picked up, you know, right there. Uh, so that there is no incentive for the smugglers to use that uh, th that avenue to drop their goods in Pakistan and, and make some money on, on it. Uh, but I can't agree more with you. This is an area which is of a significant importance, and we'd like to continue with that. Well, so if, I, if you allow me uh, to follow up um, on this, the, there's a broader piece to this. Uh, as you know, the Afghanistan-Pakistan one, you rightly pointed out. But there has been tension uh, in the region when it comes to overland route access to Afghanistan through Pakistan to India, and vice versa, and then Afghanistan blocking Pakistan's access to Central Asia, uh, perhaps as a quid pro quo or otherwise, and this has been reported widely. Um, what is the dynamic there? And if, if, if that is caught up in the Pakistan-India relationship, then are we actually looking at this as a permanent state of affairs unless the India-Pakistan relationship normalizes or because ultimately Afghanistan is, is the biggest loser in this. They're the ones who, are, who have to gain and, you know, as we talk about peace and economic development, isn't that in Pakistan's interest as well then? Well, uh, our obligation under international law is to give access to landlocked sure. states sure. to the ports of Pakistan. Sure. that's true. And I believe Tajikistan is also landlocked. That's correct. And Tajikistan also has as much right to the ports as Afghanistan is. It is for the Afghan government to deny them right or give them that right. It's for them. If they don't want them to come through, uh, through Afghanistan to ports of Pakistan, it's, it's for them to decide. But for us, it's open. As far as access by land route is concerned, it's a different okay. ball game. It is different because even uh, our own bilateral trade with, Af with India, which has huge potential, uh, has suffered because of that. Now, as a gesture, goodwill gesture to Afghanistan, we have allowed their trucks to go to 
to Afghanistan, sure. to, to India. But we cannot possibly one day open millions of Afga Indian trucks hitting our roads and we are not prepared for that. I think it has to be part of a regime for which we need to prepare. And for, need, and for that regime to be prepared, we need a, a sane, candid, uh, civilized dialogue between the two governments. And then it can be a very much, we, uh, it's not that we don't see what you see. We do. But I think uh, the ground realities do not allow that to, to happen. Otherwise, we'll be more keen than, than anybody else. Right now. A question there. Uh, Hannah White, Central Asia Institute. Thank you, sir, for sharing your perspectives. Um, the conversation so far has touched on solutions for the here and now. Um, looking to the future, to the next generation, what can we do as far as education to ensure peace between Afghanistan and Pakistan? I think the best way is to look for win-win uh, solutions. I think uh, zero-sum strategies don't really uh, produce any winners. Uh, even if somebody produces, is somebody thinks that he's a winner, it actually at the end loses. The world that we have come to see in the globalized phase, and I hope it stays that way, is that there is an interdependence. That we, we all depend on each other for one thing or the other. And I think we all gain much more. And we've seen that the sum uh, uh, of parts is greater than the than and then the you know totality of the parts. So it, I think this is important message in our uh, that we should have faith in the future. We should have faith in win-win solutions. There are always ways out there. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example in case of Pakistan. You know the whole of Asia. There is a theme which is sweeping across Asia, which is called connectivity. Now that connectivity, uh, because Asia was least integrated. And therefore, that connectivity has caught up. And even Pakistan-China economic corridor is a manifestation of that. And now, right from, the, from day one, it was made clear to everybody that this would not be for people of Pakistan and Western China alone. It has to serve the whole region and the bigger picture, which means that and all Central Asians should be able to benefit from that. And in fact, from that, Kashgar, there are two roads going to, to Tajikistan and one road going to Kyrgyzstan and then on to Kazakhstan and others. So I think all this speaks good for everybody. And from China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, I've said it publicly and I continue to maintain the first beneficiary perhaps would be Afghanistan because the first, if you move up Gawadar, the first nearest point would be Kandahar itself. So I think we, we should look for win-win options. We should be optimistic. We should be hopeful uh, for a future. Uh, and we should not give up this theory of interdependence which arose during the globalization phase. Okay. Yerman here. Hi, uh, Phil Schrafer, retired international healthcare consultant. I know from a, I, I've spent a year in Azerbaijan, and I know from a pre previous, previous presentation at the Institute that I share with the Afghan people a love for Turkish comedy on television. Uh, my question is, Ambassador, um, you mentioned China. Could you uh, maybe expand on that in terms of their role in the Moscow meetings and their economic involvement in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Certainly, China um, is a country which is uh, an, a very important player in Asia. And uh, it so happened that uh, in 2013, when the present government took office, which was in June, and the new government uh, in China took office, which was that of President Xi, uh, uh, there was a... Uh, I don't know whether it was uh, sort of a coincidence or it, it just happened that uh, President Xi decided to focus more on the Western China, which was less developed because bulk of the economic development was on the Eastern China. And as you know, each of the port city there export something like 15 to 20 billion dollars worth of export. So the entire 
uh, eastern coast uh, was highly industrialized, whereas the western aid part of China was. So this was a discrepancy which was being created within the Chinese society. So they decided to shift their eyes towards this. Right about that time, we in Pakistan, uh, the present government, which is which has a very strong uh, 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 traction for economic agenda. Uh, uh, thought of uh, linking up uh, our board of port, which was we were developing, Gwadar, to, to Western China. And I think that's how, that was the emergence of the, uh, of the idea. Uh, but it was, it was becoming very clear to us that, uh, that we want it to be for benefit of the whole region and not just these two countries. And that is why we recently held an ECO summit where all the heads of states, of Central Asian states, uh, and Iran and Turkey came because we wanted to send out a very clear message that this whole project is, uh, is something for, for everybody. Now, how do you do that? Bulk of the concentration now is on energy. Energy because we were running energy shortages and I think by next year we'll probably be surplus in energy and we would need that surplus for another reason that I, I'll indicate to you. We're now moving into the phase of industrial cooperation. So that means along those corridors there'll be economic zones which will be built. And we have been approached by several uh, leading economies including uh, leading economies from Europe and elsewhere to come and invest in those, uh, those zones. Uh, we will need that surplus energy for that and Pakistan would, of course, be happy if the United States also come along, comes along. And, and, and Because we need to build stakes in peace in, a, in, in, in our region, whatever works. And nothing works better than trade and economic investment. Uh, they are the biggest uh, you know, stakeholders for, uh, for peace uh, in our And we need that peace. So we, uh, our uh, relationship with China is seen in that, in that context. Of course, it's a relationship based on mutual respect. And uh, 40 years ago, I remember that we served as a bridge uh, between your country and China. And we believe that we can still continue to serve as that bridge of goodwill between Pakistan, between United States and China. That's why we want to have good relations with both countries, with China, and good relations with the United States. And my presence here after my that assignment is a is a you know indication of the importance that that government attaches to our relations with your country. Lady back there. Hello, my name is Habiba. Um, Habiba Ashna, and I'm a student. Um, I was a refugee in Pakistan, so I would like to thank the United States and United Nations for their help in Pakistan, because I think mostly we were helped by the United States and the United Nations when we lived there. Um, secondly, um, Mr. Ambassador, so far, whatever I have heard, it actually sounds really good, but the reality on the ground is completely different. Um, the wall that was built around in uh, the border areas right now, I think there is being fence is being built in the border area, and as you said, that it was for the security reasons. If you look at it, in January 5, 2015, um, Mullah Rauf, one of the former uh, detainees who was killed in uh, um, in Afghanistan. Five Pakistani militants were killed there. He was killed by drones. Not just that, but a lot of evidence, a lot of the IS and Taliban heads were killed in Pakistan. Um, a lot of um, army from the army side, border side of the Pakistan army keeps actually um, firing rockets, firing, and they keep killing civilians on the Afghan side. So it seems like the threat is inside Pakistan and not Afghanistan. But yet, um, Afghans are being blamed for it. So when are we going to see those words turned into actions? Thank you so much. I think uh, that's precisely the perceptions which have been germinated, and they are so out of touch with the reality. Uh, I don't know when were you last in Pakistan. Uh, you need to visit that again. Uh, I thank you for thanking the United States and United Nations for your life in Pakistan, but at the end of the day, it was the Pakistani land that you were living on. And even bulk of the, the Afghan leadership have lived and earned their livelihood and studied in the institutions of Pakistan. I, it doesn't matter. Even if you don't recognize it, I can still live with it. But what I would like you to do is to correct your perspectives. There is no wall being built 
on the border. It was the border posts that was that were being based. You have a post where you have an immigration counter, you have a, a customs area, and you have a visitors restroom. And that is what has been built. And we will we are well within our right to do that because that's how civilized borders are managed. And we expect Afghan side also to build similar kind of facilities. In fact, we offered to build for them if they want a similar kind of facilities. These are not walls. These are natural barriers which are placed to regulate the uh, the flow. Fencing, uh, we will do, but it's a huge border, 2,600 kilometers. It's not going to be easy. We will we will do as much as we can. Perhaps it will take years. Uh, our border with India is totally fenced. Uh, uh, I believe there are many other borders which are which are which are fenced. But uh, we uh, we are doing it uh, out of interest that uh, it is uh, it is our uh, our shared interest. When you say that trouble is in Pakistan and trouble is not in Afghanistan, then you haven't seen Afghanistan. You wouldn't be here. You would be actually there. Actually, we uh, and you need to visit Pakistan. That's what I'm saying. That if you call, remain a victim of that propaganda, which is churned out from Kabul, it won't solve the problem. You are barking the wrong tree. You need to come to grips with what's what's happening actually on ground, and then you would you would see see for yourself. I can't say anything more than than uh, than that. Thank you. Um, Yes. Hi, Muhammad Ali Heather. Uh, congratulations on your recent appointment Thank and you. wishing you a long and successful tenure. You were kind enough to enumerate the diplomatic tracks uh, on the Afghan policy and hopefully enhanced cooperation between the two governments uh, will yield some results which will uh, lead to a better regional security uh, solution. But since this is your first appearance uh, in public as the ambassador, could you speak uh, uh, or could you enumerate a similar strategy for uh, the US and uh, Pakistan diplo diplomatic track, uh, especially in light of uh, the lessening of U the cutting of USAID uh, and greater economic cooperation and perhaps greater cultural exchanges between the two? Uh, countries. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, as I indicated to you, it is a multifaceted relationship that we have with the United States. Uh, within the executive branch, of course, we deal with Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture, Department of Education, and what have you, because we need, we want to deal and we do uh, with all the uh, uh, avenues of the uh, of cooperation between the two countries. Uh, but United States is a very interesting country in that sense, and I am very happy to be in Washington because Washington is is certainly different from many other capitals of the world because it's not just the executive branch that you deal with. You deal with also uh, the legislative branch, which is the Congress, because Congress has, uh, by virtue of your constitution, uh, you know, uh, so much role to play in terms of uh, sanctioning uh, money, which will make the process go. And then you have the think tank community, which is very vibrant and, and, and which uh, shapes up the public opinion and which uh, advises the, the government. Uh, uh, so that engagement is also equally important apart from our uh, diplomatic engagement with, with United States. We have a fantastic dialogue between the two, uh, have always had. Uh, uh, on a scale of zero to 10, I would say that for, for eight to nine areas, we are actually cooperating with each other. And one to two areas, we have differences on which we are trying to, to, to work on. So I am very optimistic about, uh, uh, about this relationship. It would uh, stay strong, and I think uh, it will get stronger in the years to come. Masa, I know this wasn't uh, part of the topic, but since you mentioned one or two areas of, of difference and, and the others of, of agreement, um, one of the areas of difference, of course, is partly on Afghanistan. But the other one that we heard a lot about and saw a lot written about in the past year or two uh, was the nuclear element uh, and, and conversations about Pakistan's nuclear program. Would you like to enlighten the audience on where that stands and is, is there some element of convergence on the, on the position of the two sides? The rationale for Pakistan's nuclear capability is very simple. It is only for deterrence, to deter aggression against Pakistan. These are not weapons for battle. These are only weapons for deterrence or weapons for peace, as somebody called them. Uh, we have no ambition beyond 
that uh, our program will remain characterized by credible minimum deterrence and uh, we have absolutely no intention uh, beyond uh, this particular uh, uh, objectives. Yes, there are some people who like to project this as, as something which happened in the last one year. Some people got together and tried to create a, uh, you know, a big issue out of nothing. But that's not an issue between. Uh, if you want to see, even with the previous administration, I want to show you the dialogue that we have with the Department of State uh, uh, department, and within that Department of Arms Control, you see the joint statement and you would know. You know, we are cooperating, Pakistan and the United States are cooperating in nuclear safety. And touch wood, we have, uh, you know, a, a, a fabulous record of nuclear safety. You know, we've been running power plants for over 40 years, not a single accident anywhere. And I hope it stays that way because we are working very hard on nuclear safety. Nuclear security, again, now, terrorism threat is fairly subsided in Pakistan. We are pretty calm. But even when it was at the peak, nobody ever came close to or even made any rhetoric against the nuclear program of Pakistan. So, so much has been spent on, on the nuclear security of Pakistan. And we participated with the United States in the nuclear security summit process uh, all through. Uh, and we have created a center of excellence for that. We have invested hugely into nuclear security. Another area that we have worked hard on is uh, export controls. Export controls. We just do not wish to import or export anything which is of dual use. And that's why we have invested heavily on that. We are, our lists are now aligned with the lists of all export control regimes. Mm -hmm. All. Including NSC. Including nuclear suppliers group, as well as MTCR, and of course the, the, the other two as well. Now, we, uh, the fourth area we have worked hard on is command and control. And it is uh, sort of command and control is, uh, is centralized uh, so that there is no delegation of authority anywhere. And uh, it is strictly under the National Command Authority, which is chaired by the Prime Minister. And therefore, that important area is very important. So for us, this remains. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, we just had a two-day conference in Carnegie. Yeah, you know? nuclear conference. Scores of panels. Nobody talked about Pakistan's nuclear program, because everybody knows that it is well within its own limits. There were talks about others, but not about Pakistan. Okay. Um, I, I told you I was a pessimist, so let me, um, okay, let's take that question and then I'll end on the provocative note that I want to. Please. Uh, Masood Ahmadi, uh, a student and uh, a member of Afghan Green Trend. Uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Everyone knows that Osama bin Laden has been found and killed in Pakistan while you are denying his presence for over a decade in Pakistan. Mullah Omar uh, has been found and dead in Pakistan while you are telling Afghan and Americans that how Pakistan can find a turbaned mullahs amongst of a millions of turbaned Afghans. It's uh, Mullah Mansour has been killed in Pakistan. It's believed you are harboring Haqqani Network, Lashkar Taiba, and the other extremist groups inside of Pakistan. And uh, uh, do you think you can end Influence Afghanistan through mass murder and kill, and these groups who are responsible for the mass murder, torturing of Afghan and American civilians in the region. Okay. Why don't you try another policy? Do you think the time for us to buy your denial narrative is over? Let's call a spade a spade and have a frank discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I can beat that one, so maybe we will end with that. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. I, it's not the first time. You th I, uh, we, we know that you have been fed this, and it is unfortunate. And that's precisely the point I was making, that the systematic nurturing of hatred in the people of Afghanistan was not a wise investment in the people of Afghanistan. I think you need to, it's not us denying, you need to come out of this. Who was Osama bin Laden? How was he made? What was he doing in Afghanistan? And after Torah Bora bombing, why did he come to Pakistan? We don't need him. We wanted him dead yesterday. And we are happy that he got killed. But we are unhappy the way he got killed. Pakistan should have been the one we should have been taken into confidence. So there are perspectives. You see the glass from this side, I see the glass from this side. As far as Mullah Omar, his son and his brother went to Zabul and exhumed the grave to, to make sure that he, was, he never left Afghanistan. 
and, and the presidential palace fed BBC a wrong news that he died in Karachi in a hospital two years ago. You see, this is the kind of propaganda which spreads hatred, which is wrong. It is not a wise investment. And that is why I'm saying you have, you have to come out of that. If you come out of that, you will find that things will be much better. This whole rhetoric, oh, people going there and killing Afghans by the hundreds and thousands. I don't think that is how it is happening. Uh, we have no, as I have said that, we have no uh, 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 love for anyone, anyone, including Taliban or Haqqanis, who commit violence anywhere. Violence is not a commodity with which you can buy anything today. And we would not want that, that to happen. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. I, I will not try what I was going to. <laughs> let, me, let me end on a nicer note. Uh, right. by, by first of all, thanking you for taking the time and, and speaking to us. Um, we're actually fortunate to host you and your uh, predecessor um, for your first sort of event, public um, event at, at a think tank at, uh, in Washington. So thank you for giving us this opportunity. Let me just end by then asking you, in your two or three years or however uh, long you stay here, what is your benchmark for success? How do you walk away as a satisfied ambassador at the end of two or three years? Well, I would be one happy man if our relations with the United States uh, are further uh, deepened uh, and uh, we continue to cooperate in many areas that we have been uh, and also am able to open new areas of cooperation. You know, we have not focused. There was somebody who's, who spoke about the health, cooperation in health. You know, these are the areas on which I think Pakistan and Pakistani diaspora is, has invested heavily. We have 18,000 Pakistani doctors uh, registered with just one organization who are working in the United States. I think these are the people who are investing in this relationship. We need to diversify the areas of cooperation. And if I am able to do that, I'd be one happy man. Thank you very much for joining us, and please join me in thanking thank you. Ambassador.